The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. So tonight we're very happy to have with us uh, Jane Hayward, who comes uh, to us now as a research fellow at, uh, in the government department at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, prior to that, she finished her PhD uh, very close to us at NYU uh, in 2012 in East Asian Studies, uh, and then went about as far in one direction as she could go, uh, which is to Tsinghua University in Beijing, where she was on a postdoc uh, for three years, from uh, 2013 to 2016, in the Institute of Contemporary Chinese Studies at the School of Public Policy and Management there at Tsinghua. Uh, and that was when we first met. She was giving a talk uh, in Seattle, uh, I think, when we first met. Uh, and then she went on, as I said, uh, to the other direction as far as she could go, uh, to LSE. Um, so we're happy to have found a way to catch her and bring her here this time. Uh, she has worked on a range of topics, uh, including uh, urban villages and uh, agriculture in China, uh, but is here to talk to us about a, a separate uh, topic, new project she has today on think tanks in China. So please join me in welcoming Jane Hayward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very happy to be invited here to give this talk. Um, I should start by saying that the starting point for this paper is um, that in reading a lot of um, reports on Chinese think tanks, something in particular keeps coming up uh, when I read uh, reports by both media pundits and also uh, scholars, and I'm talking in particular about scholars in the UK and the US for the most part, um, that they're criticized for being... Um, for not being independent. In other words, they're not really taken seriously. And this, this paper is in large part a critique of that perspective that keeps on coming up. And the approach that I'm taking is how the rise of think tanks in China are bound up with questions of class power uh, as this Chinese state becomes increasingly integrated into the global capitalist economy. Um, and as I go through, I will of course have to say something about how these new type think tanks are bound up um, with the rise of Xi Jinping, which is uh, so, so topical at the moment. So, to begin, there's a kind of conundrum around the question of Chinese think tanks. Um, and if this is a very interesting time as well for me to be giving this talk with the National People's Congress having just taken place in Beijing uh, and the end of presidential term limits um, having just been confirmed at that meeting, which appears to consolidate Xi Jinping's power and the strengthening of authoritarianism in China around Xi Jinping and his cohort. So the conundrum is, how do we understand think tanks in China, given that they are being promoted by Xi Jinping um, at the same time that we're seeing an increased political and ideological, uh, uh, increased political and ideological control under that same leadership? And given that context, do we in fact take them seriously? Um, so having talked about how think tanks are usually talked about by uh, a lot of media pundits in the US and UK, let me talk, um, let me give you an excerpt from The Economist. This is an article called The Brains of the Party from March 2014. Uh, Truly independent think tanks are not something the Communist Party really wants. They're a feature of civil society as liberal democracies define it, not as the party defines it. Those think tanks, and that's in inverted commas to show that they're not really think tanks, those think tanks with the most influence in China do not write for the public, but for a much smaller audience. They are trusted instruments of the Communist Party and the state. The biggest danger of this emperor-advisor relationship is that it rewards advisors who tell the emperor what they already think. And this idea that Chinese think tanks are only telling China's leaders what they want to hear um, or, um, or what they already think is something that comes up over and over again. So let's take on the set of assumptions behind this particular critique of Chinese think tanks. Uh, the way that think tanks are traditionally or conventionally understood comes from a set of assumptions 
based on the fact that think tanks first emerged in the uh, early 20th century in the US and UK. And so they're considered fundamentally liberal democratic institutions. They're supposed to be independent from government, which means both of them and to be institutionally independent and also privately funded. Um, they're supposed to operate within a free marketplace of ideas. This is a term you hear a lot about think tanks. And it kind of assumes that debates therefore take place within a level playing field. There's not much a dis of a discussion about how power operates or, and how class power in particular operates. And it, this also misses out the question of ideology. In other words, how, how ideas and discourses, including within liberal democracies, tend to be structured within a particular framework of what is considered acceptable and relevant to talk about, whereas ideas which don't fit into that discourse are considered irrelevant or somehow unacceptable. And also, uh, think tanks are supposed to be, in, or uh, they're thought about as being uh, embedded within civil society. And that assumes that uh, think tanks represent the interests of society as against the state. And it's an assumption that views think tanks as somehow democratic institutions. Uh, but it misses the question or any kind of analysis of, how, of whose interests think tanks are in fact representing. So let's have a look at a couple of uh, critiques of this um, more traditional view of think tanks. There's a great book by Thomas Medvitz that came out in 2012 called Think Tanks in America. And Medvitz talks about think tanks as being unique institutions in that they are, they have to be, um, they have to operate in such a way that they're constantly trying to um, uh, uh, live up to four different four different conditions at the same time. That is, they need to secure funding, so they need to please their donors. They have to garner publicity. Uh, they have to maintain a scholarly reputation, so they can't get too close to government institutions, or at least they can't appear to get too close to government institutions. But at the same time, they need to foster political influence. And to quote Medvedev, the need to cater to all four at once powerfully limits think tanks' capacity to challenge the unspoken premises of the policy debate, to ask original questions, and to offer policy prescriptions that run counter to the interests of financial donors, politicians, or media institutions. In other words, he's saying this idea of the free marketplace of ideas, it doesn't really exist. Uh, another article that I want to draw your attention to is a great um, jointly authored or collectively authored article by, uh, uh, that appeared in Critical Policy Studies called The View from Nowhere. And this is um, a set of ethnographical research on the formation of British healthcare policy um, concerning the reforms to the NHS. And these scholars uh, went into, I think they studied four think tanks and they conducted a number of interviews with the heads of these think tanks and the scholars within these think tanks to establish how this policy concerning British healthcare was um, put into practice and how they decided on what policies they were going to be advocating to the British government. And what they found was these think tanks worked a lot backstage in order to build ties with government ministers and with corporate donors not only to get their ideas heard, but in order to establish which ideas would be palatable to government officials in the first place. So in other words, the healthcare debate took place largely behind closed doors without any public consultation whatsoever. Uh, the result has been that um, the NHS has been chronically funded, underfunded for years, and he's being slowly dismantled and privatized uh, this is in the face of actually widespread public disapproval, but there's nothing really that the public can do about it because this package of reforms was decided upon and then presented to the British public pretty much fait accompli. So think tanks involved in this supposed debate were in fact adopting a set of neoliberal norms and assumptions about uh, the benefits of efficiency, choice, and privatization. There wasn't really any free and public debate or exchange of ideas about what those terms meant or whether or, or, or in whose interest they were operating. Um, so the debate itself took very much took place very much within the ideological framework to which the British government was subscribing at the time. Um, 
any kind of think tanks which operate outside of this set of uh, this kind of neoliberal ideology is going to have quite a hard time getting their ideas heard or taken seriously. There are a few exceptions to that, but that's kind of the dominant way that think tanks in uh, the US and the UK have been operating. So just to conclude this section, Anglo-American think tanks I don't think can be meaningfully said to represent the interests of society against the state. They're structurally inclined to further the interests of corporate donors and work to get their ideas onto the government agenda by, in fact, telling politicians what they want to hear. The ideas advocated by think tanks remain firmly within the framework of what is considered politically acceptable at the time, and there's no real genuine free market place of ideas when it comes to uh, advocating about matters of government policy. So why is it that China's leaders are deciding to promote think tanks now? Uh, the next section of um, what I'm going to talk about actually comes from a set of interviews that I carried out while I was in, uh, at the Institute for Contemporary China Studies at uh, Tsinghua University from 2013 to 2016. Um, there I was able to talk to a lot of scholars working within think tanks or scholars who were studying Chinese think tanks and involved in the debates about the development of think tanks in that country. And the kinds of ideas that they came up with about why um, why China was needing think tanks were scholars within regular government research institutes um, are very skilled at gathering data and drafting political speeches, but actually they weren't really considered to be very good at coming up with um, sophisticated ways of interpreting data or presenting new and innovative ideas or proposing new strategies. Also, the bureaucracy, the government bureaucracy, was designed with conformity uh, in mind, which means that government researchers are unwilling to lose promotion opportunities or offend their bosses by suggesting or proposing unconventional ideas which might rock the boat. There are also uh, the way that the bureaucratic institutions are organized is that there are rigid controls on staff numbers, which means, it's, again, this is about maintaining the stability and the status quo of the system, so it's very difficult to recruit uh, new members from outside who might have new kinds of ideas. And any new ideas that government researchers do come up with, they're stovepiped. Stovepiped is a term that means ideas are passed upwards within institutions rather than exchanged for debate with scholars or other institutions outside. So it's a very insular system. And the system is conducive, in fact, to institutional conflict. That means that different ministries tend to compete for influence with one another and uh, for a larger slice of the central budget funds rather than cooperating to try to come up with disinterested policy advice, which is what really uh, Chinese leaders are looking for. Also, with China's growing role in world affairs, there's kind of been a blurring of the policy boundaries between uh, the domestic and the international, and that seems to be requiring far more complex forms of analysis that um, government researchers simply aren't trained to provide. Um, and a number of officials have apparently privately expressed frustration that in international deliberations, particularly with the US, Chinese negotiators are repeatedly being outwitted by their counterparts in the US who have better trained advisors. This is obviously a source of frustration. Uh, so what are these new type think tanks? Uh, these, these have started to be promoted quite seriously since Xi Jinping came to power in uh, 2012. Um, the plan is to approve 50 to 100 so-called new type think tanks by 2020. And these 50 to 100 are specially selected and approved think tanks by the, cent by the party central committee, uh, which will be, um, have special connections to government. There'll be special, uh, special advisors to government. Um, and the list of the first 25 of this 100 think tanks was released in uh, December 2015 while I was in Beijing actually working on this paper. And the rest, other think tanks are currently vying amongst themselves to get onto that list. Um, 
So official think tanks, there, there are three kinds of think tanks, broadly speaking. There are many different kinds, but broadly speaking, there are official think tanks, which are government institutions, um, attached to government institutions. So, for example, the National Development and Reform Commission is attached to the State Council. Then there are semi-official think tanks, uh, which are set up by government institutions and they're ma managed by state-approved personnel. Um, so, for example, institutions within the Chinese, um, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences would count as semi-official think tanks. I think two of those have made it onto the, um, the list of the first 25 official new type think tanks. Uh, then what I'm going to talk about more in this talk later are civil think tanks, which are non-governmental, they're mostly privately funded, um, and they don't have institutional or, or any serious institutional connections to government. Um, and two of those that I'll be talking about later are the China Center for International and Economic Exchanges and the Unirule Institute for Economics. Uh, there's no fixed model, however, so there are a lot of think tanks within universities, for instance, and they're sometimes called civil think tanks, even though the fact that you know universities are really considered government institutions, so it's a bit, the definitions are a little bit blurred. So all of these, um, what will eventually be 50 to 100 official uh, national, nationally recognized new type think tanks, all of them are going to be affiliated to the Central Propaganda Department of the Chinese Communist Party. That's now been renamed to the Central Publicity Department, which sounds a lot friendlier, but it's the same thing. And through this connection, their uncensored reports will be transmitted directly to the top leadership and uh, whichever government department is considered relevant for that report. Uh, and this is designed to diversify and accelerate the channels of expertise into central policy making, bypassing uh, government bureaus. And this appears to be one of the ways that Xi Jinping uh, is trying to get around the uh, government bureaucracies. Part of his consolidation of power has clearly been to shift um, shift political power away from the bureaucracies and onto the party and onto himself and his um, his advisors. And one of the ways he's doing it is to set up this think tank system to get around the bureaucracies. Um, some people have been saying with uh, Xi Jinping's, um, what people are calling, some people call Xi Jinping's power grab, that there's going to be a shutdown on any meaningful forms of political debate. I don't really think that's true. I think this think tank system shows that actually debate is going to be taking place. It will certainly be within a particular ideological framework, but there's certainly going to be meaningful debate happening. Um, so, because these think tanks are happening in a non-liberal democratic regime, there have been uh, a number of attempts by think tank scholars to try to uh, re-evaluate the term independence because that's considered kind of only relevant, uh, certainly in the way that it's usually talked about, that's considered to only really apply within liberal democracies. So a very uh, well-known think tank scholar, Zhu Xu Feng, for example, has talked about how think tanks should only be regarded as, should be regarded as independent as long as they constitute uh, an independent legal personality, which determines that they work to serve the public interest, uh, and that they're not attached to a larger government department or corporation. And uh, another well-known scholar, Huang Gang, who, full disclosure, he was my boss while I was working at Tsinghua, He's come up with uh, three different uh, criteria for what, it, what counts as independence. Uh, he says that one is the, um, a think tank should count as independent if the scholars there have autonomy in selecting their topics of research, autonomy in conducting their research, and the ability to publish independently. Now, Huang Gang's think tank has just recently made the list of the first official 25 think tanks uh, that are now um, government recognized. And uh, as he was, was explaining to me as I was doing this, uh, writing this paper, um, there is something called commissions topics or um, assigned topics, which means that the government institution, in this case it was the National Development and Reform Commission, will come to him with a list of about 100 topics that they want to be um, researched. And he'll, he'll select a few from the list. So for the last five year plans, I think he selected 11 topics. And he was then paid by the National Development and Con Reform Commission 
to work specifically on those topics. And anything he published for them would have been confidential and classified. But at the same time, he said he was writing on all kinds of other things and had, his, um, had the scholars within his institution carrying out research on other topics independently, which he could then publish on his own. So in that sense, he would say his, his think tank was still, for the most part, independent. So I'm now getting to the theoretical part of this talk. Um, the framework that I used for thinking about how to understand think tanks is, in China is called the internationalization of the state. Now this is a historical materialist approach which is influenced by uh, the work of a number of uh, political geographers and historical sociologists, in particular uh, Bob Jessup, Robert Brenner, William Robinson. Um, and what this looks at is how nation states uh, transform as they engage with the global capitalist economy. And in particular, it looks at how nation states institutional, spatial and social structure are transformed to accommodate to the needs of the global capitalist economy. And the emphasis on here largely is on the transformation of the class structure. And analysis looks at how state institutions are, are also sites of contestation as the forces both inside and outside the state institutions, which reflect the interests of capital become, in, uh, in, and in particular, the uh, interests of international capital um, become increasingly dominant within the state. So how does this happen? Uh, political scientist Robert Cox um, has come up with a kind of a three-stage uh, three explanation of how this takes place, which is quite useful to think about. First of all, uh, the community of nation states, as it were, agree on an ideal, uh, what, what he calls a global ideological consensus. Now, most recently, that has been dominated by the United States, uh, and it's been ideologically rooted in neoclassical economics and, more recently, uh, neoliberalism. And this has been promoted by the US in universities, in international education and exchange programs, um, and also uh, funded by institutions. This promotion of these ideas has been funded by int uh, international institutions such as the Ford Foundation. And it's also been promoted through various ways um, uh, due to US dominance of the international institutions such as the World Bank, for example. Uh, participation within this uh, global order, um, founded on this global ideological consensus, is then hierarchically structured, according to Robert Cox, and the promotion of the ideological consensus within the underrepresented states take place, takes place, to quote Cox, by people who have been socialized to the norms of the consensus. So in other words, what he's talking about our local staff who graduated from universities in the advanced capitalist countries, usually the UK and the US. Um, they hold positions at uh, major financial institutions and then they return to their home countries and they take high level jobs in institutions where they work to promote the ideas of the global ideological consensus uh, and effectively they work to promote the interest of global capital within their own country through their work in these institutions. And this cohort is what I refer to in this paper as the global technocracy. So it's a powerful technocratic class of managers and experts whose role is to facilitate and negotiate the policies of the global ideological consensus. So please note, think tanks are one of the institutions through which the global technocracy operates, but also this particular cohort, this class of people, um, they're not generally democratically accountable, so I really don't buy this idea that think tanks represent the people and uh, are more or less democratic institutions. Uh, so what kind of concrete processes do we want to look at when we're looking out for signs of the internationalization of the state? Um, in other words, where do we look for clues that the forces that are representative of the global ideological consensus and of uh, the interests of global capital have achieved dominance within state institutions? Well, we're looking, for example, for changes in finance and taxation policy within particular nation states. We're looking for changes in property rights, in particular um, moves towards privatization, as we've certainly been seeing in China. 
uh, we're looking for the production of a land market, uh, specifically one designed with the interests of global investors in mind. And we're looking for the production of uh, an army of mobile, low-cost workers, again, um, to, uh, in, in, to work to supply cheap labor to incoming global capital. Um, and also the production of an ideology conducive to maintaining a stable, compliant population while these social upheavals are taking place. Um, it's important to note that all these changes constitutive of the internationalization of the state are always going to be contested. They're going to be contested inside of state institutions, uh, sorry, outside of state institutions. So, for example, um, uh, workers' rights movements in factories um, to get better labor conditions, um, but also inside, this resisted inside state institutions, and we can see that in disagreements over policy making. So, for example, in China, we can see the major debates that have been taking place and are still taking place over the question of land privatization, particularly the privatization of rural land, which is certainly not an issue that is um, contained within China domestically. There are many global corporate interests that uh, would be very interested in getting access to China's land who um, are, have a role in these debates as well. Um, but of course, many Chinese policymakers view the question of the uh, privatization of rural land as providing a license for corporations to ride roughshod over peasant land rights, producing huge amounts, potentially producing huge amounts of land, uh, landlessness and possibly uh, social instability. So just to... Having, having laid out that kind of um, that theoretical framework, I'll just say what I plan to do in the rest of the paper, which is to look at uh, three interrelated processes through which the internationalization of the state is taking place in China. Uh, first of all, the internationalization of Chinese policymaking. This is the process by which China's policymakers are increasingly coming to reflect the uh, the values of the global ideological consensus. Secondly, the ways that Chinese policymakers are integrating with the global technocracy. And finally, um, I'll look at how there's an emerging capitalist class within China, allied with global capital to a large extent, which is also bound up with these same processes. So when scholars talk about internationalization, and particularly when they talk about um, internationalization with respect to China's think tanks, what they're usually talking about is China's increased participation in international institutions, uh, increased international exchanges, and uh, moves to increasingly strengthen China's voice in global policymaking. Um, and also to uh, increase China's interests, uh, uh, to promote China's national interests in reshaping uh, the global world order. These are, these are issues that get talked about a lot. But I'm approaching this from a slightly different perspective. Uh, I'm looking more internally about how, at how the Chinese nation state, its society and institutions are themselves being restructured and adapted uh, to the requirements of the world, uh, world capitalist economy and how think tanks are implemented. Uh, implicated in this. So how has this been taking place in China since 1978? Uh, there are four um, angles from which I'm looking at this. Um, the first one is that there's been a large increase in scholars studying abroad um, and also a large increase in their prestige when they return home, which is largely promoted by, has been largely promoted by the state um, since, uh, since Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1978. So according to the Ministry of, of Education, from 1978 to 2007, 1.21 million students and scholars studied abroad, and 319, 700 returned. And uh, a large number of these scholars, well, for a start, they would have received better perks on the job and higher salaries than scholars who, who'd only studied in China because they're considered more valuable. Um, and a large number of these would have taken on positions at leading universities, at policy and research institutions, um, and at, uh, in Chinese banks. 
Secondly, there have been changes to um, China's official state policy discourse, become increasingly compatible with the neoclassical or neoliberal discourses which are characteristic of the, um, the global ideological consensus. And one of the most striking changes that's taken place is the disappearance of the language of class. Um, relatively suddenly, at around 1985, the, uh, the word class, which is jieji, disappeared from policy documents, just disappeared, it's, it happened strikingly fast. Um, and it was replaced with the word social strata, jie tang, which is a different concept. It's a reference to um, wealth disparities, and it's a much more fluid category, and it doesn't carry the connotations of systematic oppression um, within the capitalist system that you get with the word class. Um, and this took place, this is something that a number of scholars have written about, um, most, most prominently Pun Gai. And she points out how this took place in the mid-80s just as a working class was starting to emerge in China. So in other words, with uh, large numbers of layoffs from state-owned enterprises and with migrant workers flooding into the cities from the countryside, you get this new working class emerging, but suddenly they don't have the language of class to represent themselves politically. So as, um, as Pun Gai puts it, they're rendered inarticulate. Um, and this was a deliberate strategic move by the state in the interests of uh, political stability. Um, and in fact, similarities can be drawn with the disappearance of class analysis. This is something also pointed out by Pun Gai. Um, disappearance of class analysis in, from academic studies in the 1980s as well, under Reagan and Thatcher in the US and the UK, just as neoliberal policies were starting to take hold in those countries. And we might look at this as part of the same kind of process. And third, uh, the Chinese government has embraced scientific expertise and sought to recruit technocrats into the bureaucracies at all levels. This is during the reform period, uh, from the, certainly from the beginning of the 1980s. And again, this is a deliberate strategy following the turbulent years of the Cultural Revolution to produce a politically stable environment of managers and technocrats that are, shall we say, less uh, susceptible to uh, social and being socially and politically motivated. And this has worked to further depoliticize Chinese policy discourse um, and remove from discussion uh, the language of class and Marxist categories in favor of uh, the language of science and rationality. And this is also parallels or, or, or closely reflects uh, something that happened in the US in the 1950s. There was a turn to uh, scientific expertise in US policy making, uh, which was promoted during the 50s by the Rand Corporation, which was a, a very prominent, well, is a very prominent uh, US think tank um, with very close ties to the military. Um, and this, again, was a political strategy to undermine Marxist categories and socialist politics, which would have been considered dangerous and subversive during the Cold War era. And fourth, uh, a close alliance it started to emerge um, between this new technocratic class in China um, and an emerging entrepreneurial class which uh, the scholar Lin Chun has referred to as a crooked fusion of marketization and bureaucratization oriented towards capital and in particular uh, international capital. And many of these entrepreneurs, of course, were also overseas returnees. Uh, and over the past decade, um, these entrepreneurs and this, this um, class class alliance have been asserting their own political and economic interest by funding think tanks and taking on uh, managerial positions within them. Uh, there's a, a scholar at the Brookings Institute called Chung Lee who has analyzed these processes. Uh, and he's talked about this in particular with respect to the China Center for International and Economic Exchanges, which, as I mentioned earlier, is on the list of the, 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 list of the first 25 um, officially recognized new type think tanks. Um, and this is a membership organization with many leading entrepreneurs and CEOs among its members. And it's funded by their membership fees and donations. So in other words, this particular think tank is having a huge amount of um, private and corporate capital going into it. So all of these four changes that I've talked about 
uh, and in particular this this strong alliance between the technocratic officials and uh, and entrepreneurs are starting to have an impact on the shaping of um, Chinese think tanks. So now let me say something about how the global technocracy is operating within China. That is how Chinese scholars are starting to converge or integrate into the global technocracy. Um, this is happening whereby a set of scholars and policymakers, uh, generally who trained overseas, uh, often economists who trained at prestigious US and UK institutions, um, and they took on uh, posts uh, at important international financial institutions, and they're, uh, they're very much oriented towards uh, the global ideological consensus and to promoting uh, and implementing its uh, values within the Chinese state. So let me talk about um, two scholars in particular. One is Huang Gang, again, my former boss. Um, he's head of the Institute for Contemporary China Studies at the School of Public Policy and Management at Tsinghua, um, which again is one of the new type, the first 25 new type think tanks. Um, he, is, uh, he was a postdoc at Yale in 1991. He was a postdoc at the Center for International Studies at MIT in 1998. He regularly recruits uh, scholars with graduate training uh, into his think tank at Tsinghua, in, in particular graduate training from the US and the UK. Um, and he writes regular reports for China's top leaders, summarizing and explaining the key reports from institutions such as the UNDP and the World Bank and interpreting their significance for China. Um, so he very much sees as part of his role encouraging China's leaders to produce policy making which is compatible with international norms and standards. Um, <clears throat> and it's worth talking about this new mechanism of feedback for, for Chinese think tanks scholars, which is called the pi uh, Previously, when a, a, a scholar would write a report and send it off to a government ministry or, or address it to a particular political leader, um, they would have no idea. The scholar or the author of the report would have no idea if it had been taken seriously. But lately, um, the Pisha system is a signature that a particular leader writes on the report um, and it basically says, this is interesting, we should take it seriously, or this is interesting, please send it off to this department. And usually, occasionally the original author would find out about that from word of mouth and know that his report had been taken seriously. But now these Pisha, these signatories, signatures are being scanned and the scan is being sent back to the author. And um, Huang Gang and his institute are very proud that he's got quite a large number of Pishu, uh, including several from Li Keqiang. So his reports do appear to be getting quite a lot of attention. And the Pishu has been um, it's been adopted as one of the ways that university departments are being ranked. It's like how many publications do you have? It's also now taken into account how many Pishu you have. Um, so it's become how influential these things are is becoming increasingly important. Um, another uh, another thing, another interesting thing about Huang Gang is that he was I was t he was talking to me about how um, he was trying to. Uh, make clear to me how he doesn't always tell the government what they want to hear because I was interviewing him about this issue. And he told me about a um, report that he'd written in 2009 just before the Copenhagen summit on climate change. Uh, and he teamed up with some scholars from the Br Brookings Institute. And he wrote this report which was trying to persuade China's leaders to cooperate with the US government, which was then Obama in coming to some kind of agreement on climate change. Um, and he used the slogan, one world, one dream, addressing it, that was the um, 2008 slogan for the Olympics, one world, one dream. And he addressed that slogan to the um, uh, to China's uh, uh, premiers and, and, and uh, the leadership and said, in, in other words, saying, don't see the US as your rival, you need to cooperate on this. But unfortunately, um, China, China's leaders at the time were too concerned that the America was trying to um, uh, uh, hinder their development by imposing climbing, climate change um, restrictions on them. So, so uh, an agreement never happened, unfortunately. Uh, 
Secondly, um, Justin Yufulin, who a number of you may have heard of, um, he's a very famous economist, a professor at Peking University. He's also one of the vice chairs of the China Center for International and Economic Exchanges that I mentioned earlier. He has a PhD from Chicago, which is uh, renowned for its promotion of neoclassical economics. He played an important role in the WTO debates, uh, persuading China's uh, more conservative leaders of the benefits of opening up China's economy to international market competition. Uh, and at Peking University, he helped to redesign the economics curriculum to be more in line with the American model, and particularly the Chicago model of economics. Uh, he was chief economist and senior vice president at the World Bank uh, from 2008 to 2011. He was a founding member of the China Center for Economic Research, which is a think tank at Peking University. In 2008, that became the National School of Development. Uh, and in 2013, that, uh, the National School of Development, that think tank, was uh, ranked in the top five of uh, think tanks under the category of highest professional influence in the national ranking system, national think tanks ranking system uh, compiled by the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, and in 2015, uh, the National School of Development was also included in the um, National First 25 list of new type think tanks. Um, within the National School of Development, um, Lynn heads a smaller think tank called the Center for New Structural Economics. Uh, and this smaller center is becoming, uh, I think, quite influential now in um, formulating uh, China's overseas strategies. So, for example, um, uh, the One Belt, One Road and the Silk Road strategy, and also formulating policies for Chinese, uh, Chinese entrepreneurial activities in Africa. Um, and it's actually promoting, this, um, this institute is pro starting to promote its own version um, of development, its own development model rooted in, uh, on the basic premises of, um, taken from neoclassical economics. So to say something about how think tanks are um, increasingly bound up with emerging capitalist class dynamics within China. The tripartite elite, this term was used by um, Chung Li, the Brookings Institute scholar that I mentioned earlier. And um, it refers to uh, a kind of emerging class in its own right in China, consisting of overseas trained scholars, internationally con connected entrepreneurs, technocratic officials, these three all coalescing within China's think tanks. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the think tank in particular that he's talking about is the China Center for International and Economic Exchange, where Justin Li Fu, uh, Yifu Lin is a vice chair. And um, in his paper on this, Chung Li points in particular to a well-known case where officials, property developers, bankers, and public intellectuals bound up with this think tank all cooperated to further their own interests in uh, the local real estate market. And to quote, uh, Lee, uh, to quote Chung Li, he says, only time will tell whether these fascinating changes in the composition of Chinese think tanks will contribute to profound and, uh, and positive developments in decision making and elite politics or whether this new confluence of political, economic, and academic elites will spell trouble for China's future. So I think this quote is worth highlighting because it points to an important debate among policymakers which has been going on over the last um, 10 years. Uh, for example, uh, two scholars, Xu Lan and Zhu Xufeng, in 2009, um, pointed to a shift in, in, how, in the makeup of political power during the reform period um, from a mon the monopolization of power by administrative elites to the monopolization of power by an alliance of political and corporate elites. And if unchecked, these scholars argued, uh, think tanks will be absorbed into this alliance and will represent only elite interests, not the interests of marginalized and marginalized social groups, which um, they believe was really the role that think tanks should be doing. So this has been quite a large ongoing debate in China over the last 10 years. 
Um, and the language of the debate um, is couched in terms of powerful interest groups, Qiang Shi Li Tuan Ti, not class, because of course class now we can't use that term because it's considered politically unacceptable. But class, I think, is really what they're talking about. Um, and these class interests, these powerful class interest groups, they're usually to, they're very often talking about real estate uh, when when these debates come up in the literature. Um, and this is against weak groups. This is against the interests of weak groups, Russia Junti, that they're operating. And uh, weak groups are usually said to be represented by uh, pe the peasantry and migrant workers. So scholars and pundits outside of China who are arguing in favor of independence for think tanks are missing uh, are missing the, the fact that this debate is taking place. They're missing the ways that independence in China means the capture of think tanks by emerging uh, emerging capitalist class represented by this uh, political and corporate alliance. And this debate which is ongoing is largely taking place over the question of civil think tanks which are independent from government institutions. And they are considered, um, well, they're uh, these particular think tanks are actually kind of valorized by a lot of um, more liberal-minded scholars, certainly outside, certainly in the West, who think that these are more genuine think tanks because they're, they don't have government ties. Um, but actually, these are considered by a lot of policymakers in China to be of most concern. Uh, several think tanks, they have no limit on funding because they're not bound up with uh, government budgets the way that uh, official think tanks are. Um, and a few of them have attracted very large amounts of corporate and foreign funds. Um, and some of them are actually managing to outcompete uh, government research institutions in terms of hiring the best scholars, often overseas scholars, because they're able to pay um, higher salaries. Um, but actually, recently, their development has been restricted. Um, there aren't that many successful civil think tanks. Um, and statistics show from 2013 that there are only 5% only of think tanks are civil. Um, a law in 2005, this is the, largely the reason, a law in 2005 uh, compelled civil think tanks to register with the uh, Civil Affairs Bureau. Um, and to also to register with a local official institution, which many were unable to do. So, of course, um, those think tanks basically collapsed, and now there are, there are very few of them. Um, but critics of these think tanks claim that because they find um, funding so difficult to attract, because they don't have the benefit of being able to attract government funding, um, they're more susceptible to being co-opted by overseas interests. In other words, um, um, brought up by Western interests um, because they need to appeal to them for foreign funding. Um, so this debate is taking place largely between two camps in China. I mean, it's a complex debate, but to sort of ca characterize what it looks like. Um, the first camp is arguing in favor of uh, the development of a donor co culture in China in order to diversify uh, the source is going to think tanks. Uh, and this, um, this camp tends to idealize the US government think tank system as a model uh, and advocates increased independence for think tanks from government and calls for things like tax incentives to encourage corporate donations into think tanks and um, actually suggests that maybe some people think that uh, there's a uh, a corporate lobbying system beginning to emerge in China uh, that think tanks are going to become increasingly powerful in terms of uh, in terms of their impact on policy making. Uh, I mean, from from in, entrepreneurs are going to become increasingly powerful in terms of their impact on policy making via think tanks. But the second camp is um, much more critical of uh, of this uh, uh, of uh, civil think tanks. Uh, and much more critical of the U.S. Civil, of the U.S. think tanks in particular, and very skeptical of this um, this concept of the free market of ideas. Um, and a good representation representation of this camp is uh, an article that appeared in Con Millet, which is a military journal. Uh, and this article appeared in I think it was 2015, and it drew heavily. 
on a report from a New York Times investigative report uh, which examined the close links between major think tanks in the US, especially Brookings, um, and, also, and real estate corporations. And it basically was pitched in terms of a warning to China saying, um, don't allow too much corporate funding into your think tanks because this is what will happen. Um, they argue that think tanks should be contained within government institutions in order to create what they call an internal market of ideas. Or they talk about this idea of central ideas and broad interests. In other words, you have a set of think tanks within government institutions, but all representing um, maybe different aspects of society um, in order to balance um, how the debate takes place. So in other words, the interests of migrant workers and peasants and corporations are all able to take place on a more level playing field because they're contained within government institutions. Um, civil think tanks are considered to be uh, important because, uh, as some argue, they're further from the political power center and therefore they're more representative of social interests. But the idea is that their development continues to be restricted so that they can't become too powerful um, and have a disproportionate role in the policy making process. So just to finish, um, it's worth saying something about the Unirul Institute of Economics, uh, which I mentioned earlier. This is a very well-known think tank that for a while did, um, it's a civil think tank uh, that gets a lot of its funding from corporations. I think they take as a, a matter of pride that they don't accept any um, government funding. And for a while they were very uh, successful in China. Um, they very much promote um, free market interest and privatization. Um, but in the past couple of years there have been reports in the Western media talking about um, government efforts to hamper their activities, for example, closing down their conferences or pre pre preventing the, the, their scholars from traveling abroad and things like that. And this is talked about as um, a crackdown on free speech. That's how it's talked about in the media. Um, and it certainly is. It certainly is a, um, a hindering of free speech. But the way of presenting it that way actually misses the ways that think tanks such as Unirul are promoting policies such as, in, such as the privatization of rural land, which are, it's not just a question of free speech, it's also a question of um, the extent to which global capital uh, is able to have control over Chinese policy making. Um, and something that's pointed to by um, in China by critics of Unirul is, for example, uh, the close connections between, between Unirule and the Cato Institute, which is, you, you probably know, a very famous uh, think tank in the US, which has been particularly vocal um, in, uh, in trying to lobby and advocate uh, the Chinese government to privatize its land, which um, a lot of policymakers in China see as um, a serious call for concern because it may um, accelerate processes of um, peasant land expropriation. Uh, so to finish, um, what I really want to do is say, when we, when we examine the question of Chinese think tanks, um, let's treat with real skepticism this question of um, if they're independent, they'll somehow be more democratically representative and let's let's perhaps look at the context of how this debate is operating in China. If we want to look at where China where China's think tank system is going in the future, um, well there's a number of directions it might take. Are we seeing the emergence of a corporate lobbying system like we see in the US? Um, or alternatively, is this system going to be successfully balanced within government institutions to maintain some kind of level playing field, which is what a number of scholars are, and policy makers are advocating for. And yet the question arises here, if the interests of global capitalism are already, if those kinds of vested interests are already deeply entrenched within government institutions, how realistic is that really? Um, or another interpretation is, are these think tanks uh, best understood in fact as a kind of massive surveillance system that are going to be reporting on social is issues and social problems back to the government? Um, 
as a form in the end of maintaining some kind of helping the party state to maintain social stability, but um, in the end preventing any more more democratic form of politics from emerging. Um, thank you. I'll finish there.